Thank you, Pauline, and thank you very much for um, the invitation to, to talk today. Um, I'm very pleased that, that Pauline introduced uh, uh, my friend, uh, who I call Yar, um, because I didn't want there to be a recurrent theme of a Cambridge academic being unable to, present, to um, properly pronounce the name of someone they're trying to introduce. Uh, um, so, in any case, Yar Yar um, is... Uh, is a fantastic academic in the University of Ghana. She's uh, been very senior within the university as a Pro Vice Chancellor, who's done much to set up the uh, development within the university. Um, uh, Yar is a uh, internationally known uh, uh, zoologist and um, an ornithologist, uh, but al also has has really uh, f fantastic knowledge, um, experience of of uh, wildlife uh, and wildlife disease issues uh, in in West Africa, but obviously specifically in Ghana. And I'm really sorry that she's not here to make this presentation and that you're going to have to, uh, have to listen to me. This work, though, is more than just the work that, that Yara and I have done. It's, uh, this is a, a large, multi-institutional, interla international collaboration that, that has built up from um, what was initially a small-scale collaboration between um, three institutions, two in, two in the UK, the Institute of Zoology, um, the programs led by Andrew Cunningham, um, and, and also the University of Ghana and the Ghana Wildlife Division uh, with Richard Suiri is a key part of our collaborations within, um, uh, scientific collaborations within Ghana. But th this work has uh, involved um, for, uh, so many different uh, disciplines from the social sciences where we've had a lot of input from the Institute of Deve Development Studies uh, and a program led by Melissa Leach, who is now director there of that whole institute. Um, and also uh, moving from social sciences through all biological sciences our ecology, uh, microbiology, virology, uh, epidemiology, veterinary science, um, but also into mathematics uh, um, and so on. And, and because of the nature of some of the pathogens we work with, we need to work with a very small number of labs around the world that, that uh, have Category 4 facilities that can deal with viruses that, that we're unable to, to work with in the laboratories, even here in Cambridge. We've been very lucky to have uh, receive uh, research funding from a wide variety of different funders, but we've done very well out of the um, a series of Welcome Trust fellowships that uh, early in the program um, for individual uh, individual fellows uh, based in Cambridge, uh, working collaboratively with with our, our colleagues and friends in Ghana, uh, were able to undertake a lot of the work as part of their their Welcome Trust fellowships. So why do we work on bats? I mean, it's a rather strange idea in many respects, um, and. Uh, and in fact, it was uh, against my better judgment to get involved in this program at all. I mean, I spent my, the, the first Wellcome Trust fellow that, uh, um, that successfully applied for money to, um, to early in the, the early stages of this, of this work. I spent a couple of months trying to persuade him to do something sensible, um, not to work on animals that, that were rather difficult to catch, and then you probably couldn't catch enough. And in the case David, um, working initially with, with Richard Suiri, uh, David Heyman, um, uh, the, to, the two of them um, t together were able to demonstrate that actually within the um, within the, uh, the systems actually you can, can uh, get very large amounts of information from quite large numbers of bats that you can catch and release and um, having sampled and uh, taking measurements from them. And, uh, and so as a, as a result of that, I rather reluctantly got involved in this and that's tr uh, turned into a, what I think is a, a very interesting um, uh, and potentially very important uh, uh, subject, subject area. And some of the reasons that the study of, of bats and pathogens within bats are important is because they are the host of so many different, um, very important, highly significant, um, and highly virulent pathogens. So the, the Lysivirus family, um, the rabies virus family, uh, I mean, I'm going to talk about the dogma that surrounds rabies a little bit, but uh, everyone knows that if you get rabies, you die. Um, and actually, that's, that's said to be true um, in, um, in all textbooks. But what's interesting about this study area is the fact that the, the bat species globally haven't read the textbooks and don't do what they should do. Um, I think we've all heard rather too much of, um, of the filoviruses, particularly Ebola, but um, also Marburg, um, particularly in West Africa um, over, over the last few years with the devastation that, that Ebola can cause when it transmits in, in, in humans. Um, but th these are viruses that find their natural home within, um, in the case of Ebola, fruit bat species in Western Central Africa. The henipavirus is a better known um, in Southeast Asia and Australia. Um, but, uh, and when we started doing this work, uh, it was said that these did not exist in Africa. Um, but one of the reasons they didn't exist in the textbooks was that no one had looked. 
Um, and, and some of the early work that, that came from, from these collaborations demonstrated very clearly that in some species of fruit bats, in fact, the henipoviruses were really very common. Um, there are also uh, other important bat viruses, and there's the SARS coronavirus um, almost certainly finds its um, normal home in uh, horseshoe bats in Southeast Asia. There's some question over the MERS coronavirus, whether this is a bat virus or a, a, a virus of the dromedary camel. Um, but you're all aware of the, the impact currently of, the, uh, of MERS coronavirus and what problems it can cause when it transmits in the, in the human population. So I think this, this list of viruses in itself, uh, without running into questions as to whether bats are fundamentally different from other, um, other classes of mammals. And remember that bats um, form 20% of all mammalian species. We don't know that, we don't sense that because we never see them, because these are animals that fly around at night. And so almost by definition we don't see them, in, in, uh, with the exception of some of the, the larger fruit bat species that you see um, in uh, uh, particularly tropical parts of the world, um, where they'll live in large obvious colonies, often um, quite a, strongly associated with human population density, which is an interesting um, feature in itself. Um, but but it's, so it's not surprising that such a large group of, of animals should um, host a few, a few viruses that can spread to us. The broader context of this, though, is, is, is that zoonoses, or infections that spread from animals to humans, um, are actually rather important for human diseases. Um, and in many cases, some of the, the, the most unpleasant human diseases, the most important human diseases, had their origins in animals. Um, and that's true from uh, diseases such as measles. Um, HIV is very well characterized as a disease that's come out of non-human primates in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but there's a far greater context than just a few nasty, well-known ones. Um, and that is the fact that, that probably um, well over half, and the precise percentages uh, vary depending on what precise definition of, of disease or emergence, uh, emerging infectious disease um, that, that you come up with. But, uh, but uh, more than half of human dis infectious diseases um, have their, their origins um, in, uh, other, uh, in other animals. Um, and of those diseases that are emerging that we're seeing more of or that we're diagnosing more, um, well over half of those have their, their original home in animals. And actually, interestingly, it's not just domestic animals. There's increasingly a reali uh, uh, realization that a um, very large proportion of these have a wildlife source rather than a domestic animal source. Although in the case of the henipoviruses, most of their disease, but not all of it, um, actually gets into humans by transmitting first from bats into domestic animals. And Hendra in, in Australia transmits through horses to kill horse vets and horse owners, um, th those, animal, th 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 those humans that deal with, with sick horses. Um, but in the case of Nipovirus, there um, was a huge outbreak in 1999 in Malaysia and Singapore that killed more than 100 pig farmers um, and slaughterhouse workers because of the widespread transmission of this disease in pigs that had started in bats. So sometimes um, the, the, the dynamic transmission um, pathways of infections between different species of animals can, can have a profound influence on how much disease you see in the human population. So why do we work on bats and viruses? Well, more specifically, other than just saying, well, they're, they're very important viruses. Well, one of the really interesting things about bats, to try and under, which, uh, which is a very important uh, bit of basic biological understanding that we don't have, is understanding why some bat species are quite resistant to rabies-like viruses. Because there is this dogma in all, um, that's what we call terrestrial mammals, including ourselves, that if we get rabies or rabies-like virus, we're going to die. And there's actually very little that you can do about it unless you're, um, you're immunized effectively. But certainly once you become ill with it, then, then the progression um, is almost, almost invariably um, uh, to, to death. But what we see in some of the older bats, in individual bats that we, that we sample in Ghana, and this is uh, work that is consistent um, with, with studies in North American, North American bats, but also uh, in other people's studies, is that the vast majority of them have been infected with a rabies-like virus before in their life. They've clearly survived, and we've, we've uh, carried out some survival analyses using, uh, using radio collars that demonstrates that, that uh, it's not just that they've had it and they're about to die, but these animals survive as well as those that haven't been infected. Um, and we don't understand why uh, you see mortality in pretty much every other species other than those where the virus is, uh, is host adapted. And the, true, the, the same is true almost certainly to an extent with, with things as nasty as Ebola as well. 
Um, you see, uh, it's not uncommon in particular species that host Ebola virus in sub-Saharan Africa, in Western Central Africa. You can find animals that have been previously infected that can survive long periods of time um, without, uh, I mean, they're diff difficult to observe, but without obvious uh, sequels, uh, with, certainly without obviously increased mortality. So how does that happen? How do these viruses persist in bats then, and not, not in other groups of species? Almost certainly, there are underpinning immunological mechanisms within all of the individual bats that get infected. They probably have a very, very um, uh, different innate immune response, and, and early work is demonstrating some of the marked differences be, uh, in um, innate and probably adaptive immunity as well. That, um, uh, but there are also very important ecologi e ecological mechanisms that allow viruses to persist in some species of bats. And that's been characterized for rabies in North America, where actually the only way that, that uh, rabies virus manages to persist in a lot of species is the fact that they hibernate for six months. So not, not only does the bat go to sleep, but the virus goes to sleep for six months of the year. Um, and that, allow, that really long in incubation period then that, that's associated with that, with that, uh, with that seasonal torpor, um, as, as a zoologist would, uh, would describe it, um, allows it to persist between the birth pulse that produces large numbers of young susceptible animals that occurs in the spring. We've also been working um, on spillover uh, and spillover risks of um, of infections from, from bats to humans. And I'm going to uh, d uh, move rather more quickly through some of this to, to try and tell you what we, uh, the specific uh, studies that we've been looking at. So we, we've been looking at the uh, persistence of pathogenic viruses in specific bat populations, looking at the mechanisms of, of persistence uh, at the po population scale at least, but, um, in, in particular, but also to an extent at the individual level, considering within and between host uh, dynamics of infection. We started to look at viral diversity, although I won't talk a lot about that, um, both, again, looking within individuals, um, and other groups have been doing that as well, but also within populations. And trying to understand this whole uh, phenomenon of spillover, of spillover infection from animals into humans, um, and trying to understand the drivers of, uh, of spillover, and the role that bushmeat in particular plays in this. And bushmeat is well, well uh, recognized as an important means that, that uh, viruses can, can pass from uh, from wildlife into, into humans, particularly hunters, but not just hunters. So the focus of a lot of our work, or not the so sole focus, is the straw-colored fruit, fruit bat Eidolon helvum. This is a, a large colonial sub-Saharan African fruit bat. Individuals have been tracked to migrate more than 2,000 um, kilometers in, a, in just a few weeks. So these are individu individual animals that can fly um, very large, uh, very long distances. It is actually the most common, and certainly the most commonly observed fr uh, fruit bat species in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you see a large roost of bats with a wingspan of about four feet living in trees in a, in a large African city, it's almost certainly the straw-colored fruit bat. Um, this is a species that, that is very resistant to this rabies-like rabies virus, and Lagos bat virus is, is the virus that, that infects this particular species. And it's also commonly infected with African henna viruses. There's a, 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 uh, the Vice Chancellor mentioned, and you'll all be aware of the massive cu cultural diversity across the, um, the African continent, um, but certainly in West Africa, and, and, and much le rather less so in, in parts of East Africa, but certainly in, um, that's not a that's a generalisation that's incorrect. Um, these are widely consumed as a bush meat, um, but this uh, their consumption is rather poorly characterised in contrast to the consumption of many other um, antelope and uh, non-human primate type species. Uh, this is a migratory species, so you might see a huge colony um, for a couple of months of the year or four or five months of the year, which would make them almost completely disappear for the, for, for the rest of the year. Um, and the migratory pathways still are very, very poorly characterized. And this is a species that lives in huge roosts. So the, the, um, the population uh, that lives over the top of the second largest hospital in Ghana, uh, the 37 military-run uh, military hospital in central Accra, is up to a million bats. Now, each one weighs about 300 grams. You can work out the, the um, number of tons of biomass um, that, that is uh, represented by that population. Um, and that, that population is probably 10 times smaller than the largest uh, gathering of these bats that are is uh, recognized in Kasanka Park in Zambia, which is up to 10 million of them. 
Uh, that's a, uh, so this is a, a species that has by far the greatest migration of any, probably in biomass as well, as well as numbers, of any species in Africa. I mean, it focuses on the wildebeest migration in East Africa, but actually the reality is that bats um, probably migrate to a far greater extent than, than, uh, than, than some of these, these larger animals. Um, and what's interesting is this species lives in the middle of cities as well as in remote, remote rural areas. Um, and we've been addressing the, the deficit of, uh, of multidisciplinary studies by trying to study this in a, in a broad multidisciplinary uh, context. I'm not going to play you a video, which is rather noisy, of, of what it's really like to be under, um, uh, under this sort of number of bats, but it's um, it's really a unique experience to, to, um, to be in the middle or underneath a, a huge colony of uh, very large fruit bats. And, um, I recommend it to anyone, um, <laughs> other than Pauline, who hates them. <laughs> so we've been looking at animal studies, both natural and experimental studies. We've been looking longitudinally, um, in particular at the colony in Accra, but, uh, but in others around Ghana, and as you'll see in other parts of the, of the continent. We've conducted some small-scale experimental studies with, a, with, a, um, with a, um, a system that we have set up just outside Accra. We're looking at bushmeat and the uh, commodity and trading chains, and, um, and also hu looking at, at, uh, in humans at uh, both understanding how people interact with, with bats, um, understanding the attitudes that underlie all of that, but also undertaking some health-seeking behavior and, um, in communities that are particularly exposed to some of these large roosts of, uh, of bats to understand what might happen if people became ill with a bat virus. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of those, but I just wanted to start without running through the, the overall conceptual framework that we have, but, but we, we do have a, um, we work very, uh, work within a conceptual framework which um, has at the center of it some uh, clear natural science studies understanding how the viruses may um, persist within fruit bats, which requires you to understand the ecology, demography of the bat species. Uh, we've been looking at uh, spillover and the possibility of intermediate hosts playing a role in spillover into people, and then trying to understand the impacts that these um, infections may have in people. And there's a far broader public health concept of e an ecological ecosystem con uh, uh, context and uh, of uh, human and bat interactions, but then also thinking about how people uh, conceive and, and, uh, and uh, re react to bats um, and, uh, or wildlife more generally um, varies from, from the, the, the local level all the way through up to the international level. Um, which is also framed by the way that international agencies direct so much of uh, uh, public health uh, resource and public health policy. So we've been trying to think about uh, the way that, that this system works in all of these different uh, levels, which obviously is a very multidisciplinary approach to, um, in the way that we think about the, 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 um, the issues that we're studying. So think about the population dynamics. Um, you have large populations of bats. You catch some, try and release them, you mark them. And normally, ecological studies, you recapture them, and then you, you see what's happened in the same, same bat over time. When you've got this many, you, you never, just by chance, recapture the same, same animal. We've caught thousands of these bats in a crow, and I think we recaught three of the same ones that, that carry a ring. Um, um, but we have used uh, uh, radio collars on them, which allows you not to recapture them, to, but to know that whether they're close enough to you that, to, to enable you to conduct a standard mark recapture analysis, which is so helpful in, in terms of understanding uh, population movement and demography. This, just, the, 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 this uh, graph here just, just, just represents um, what happened with 100 bats that we put collars on, and um, we, we, at the start of a, uh, or at the end of the dry season, um, these bats then most nearly all migrated away from, um, from the colony in Accra. Um, then 20 to 25 percent of them came back again in the next dry season. Intriguingly, though, not all of them did. And uh, what's very interesting is then the population uh, stayed low for two or three years, but then three years later, um, there was a far greater migration back into, um, into the Accra colony, um, which wasn't captured by the two-year long battery life of, the, uh, of this particular study, but um, uh, we were able to, to count them. So you can see here you've got massively fluctuating po population numbers. Um, by the removal of, uh, of a few teeth from a few, a few of these uh, very numerous animals that, that, that we've caught and killed, um, you can see how old they are, and that enables us to look at the demographic structure of the population. And these animals will live up to 14 or 15 years, but uh, have an average age of around seven. Now, these bats look, to me, 
and I think to everyone that looks at them the same, whether they, you're looking at this massive colony, Kasanka in Zambia, or, or one of the, the, the many roosts in, in, uh, across Ghana with them. Um, and just looking at them really doesn't enable you to, to, uh, to understand how these different colonies may interact. We, however, have sampled uh, from across the range of the species, and you can see the, the range marked in hatching here, um, including some very remote islands, um, which are where the, the animals even have a morphological difference. Um, and we've used population genetics to try and understand how freely these animals mix. Um, using a standard microsatellite approach, which we've also supplemented um, with a mitochondrial DNA analysis, what we find is that the population is what a zoologist calls entirely panmictic across its con continental range. So that bat that's next to, to the, um, its, uh, its friend on a tree stump in, um, uh, in, uh, in Accra is as related uh, to its next door neighbor as it is to a bat in Kasanka in Zambia. And that's the extent of the genetic mixing of this population, which is absolutely remarkable and only um, bettered, as it were, by um, one or two mammalian mammal species and, and about one bird species. That's just how well it uh, genetically mixes across its range. And we found similar things using the um, maternally uh, inherited mitochondrial DNA. So how do, how do the infections persist in them? Well, so you have a very well mixed population, at least at the genetic level. Um, what you find, not surprisingly then, is that the viruses, just looking at the antibodies that we see in them across the continental range um, of, these, uh, of, these, uh, of these bats, um, are widespread and common. Now that, doesn't, that just means that the infection is common, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that it's exa exactly the same. And we've used um, uh, other, um, uh, actually I'll, I'll jump through to, to this, we, we've used a molecular um, uh, analysis of the um, of the virus or the virus fragments that we can isolate from the urine that we can rather simply collect under, under these colonies. Um, and what we find, and I, if I blow, show you the two halves of this blown up, is that you find the same um, virus sequences, whether you're in East or West Africa. And here are some sequences from, um, from, uh, from Ghana and from Tanzania or from Uganda, um, uh, taken from a, a well-known colony that, that used to be um, uh, on uh, Makareri Hill, um, now has moved away. Um, and is very, very similar to those, those sequence, sequence fragments that we can find in Ghana. And similar for the other branch of the family there. So, th so these viruses and these bats are mixing entirely over the whole of the sub-Saharan Africa. Migratory species is a great, is, is a great way of, of uh, virus transmission across the whole range of, the, uh, of it. Luckily, this is a species that doesn't carry Ebola. There are others that we're working on that do, but, um, but, it's, uh, but luckily it's not this massive migratory one. So this, this picture of a bushmeat cellar it, um, on the side of the road in, in Accra um, really encapsulates a lot of the issues relating to bushmeat. Um, this, this guy is not rich. You can see from, from his clothes. Um, he has bats, most of which are dead, but not all of which are dead. Um, you can see one that's, that's moving in the bottom left there. Um, well, take my word, it's moving, all right? So, uh, um, and uh, and uh, and so uh, and th these these hunters and this, these would have been slingshotted um, down because you can't use a shotgun as is used in more rural areas um, in the middle of Accra and particularly in a military-run hospital. Um, that's rather unpopular. Uh, um, the, these individuals are at quite a lot of risk of being bitten by the bats that they're, they're killing for um, to, to sell. Now, this is actually a rather unusual picture um, because uh, the, the bats, up until two years ago, um, up until the last two years, were so popular across Ghana that um, you never saw them being sold because by the time you got out of bed, um, they'd all been sold. And so even in the bushmeat markets, um, where all other species were, were um, usually visible. And most of the bats have been sold by 6.30 in the morning, so the sleepy European bushmeat worker then arrives at 8 o'clock thinking, I've got up very early for this. Um, they went hours before that. So it's uh, specifically tracking through um, bushmeat hunters, uh, bat hunters, that you know, allows us to, to characterise an extensive uh, commodity chain um, for, for bushmeat. And um, well over 100,000 of these are sold um, um, brought into Accra, widely, heavily smoked um, every year. Now, this is probably more of a conservation threat in terms of the consumption than it is a disease threat, because the smoking way of preserving the meat is a, 
probably a very effective way of, of inactivating RNA viruses, but it's, uh, it's, it's a, a massive trade which was completely uncharacterized until recently. Um, however, with small-scale hunters, many are also uh, consumed fresh, and it's probably the, it's the, the, the butcher, butchering of fresh meat and, and the hunting that is far more risky than actually just consuming a heavily smoked piece of meat. Um, and, and this is the sort of thing that they look like when smoked um, being sold in a market if you get up early enough, and that's what they look like when they're cooked fresh. Um, one of the other things I want to tell you about is a, a small-scale eth ethnographic study that we've undertaken in a, in a um, region of uh, central, uh, uh, central Gardner. Um, this is a malaria hyperendemic area. Um, we've looked in uh, both the a comparison of how people interact with Western healthcare facilities. I remember that the healthcare um, facilities in, in Ghana, uh, with the possible exception of, of Nigeria, is probably the best resourced across West Africa. Um, and uh, and uh, what, what the, w the work that was done here um, looked at patterns of healthcare usage. Um, and obviously there was a dependence on income, on what sort of signs people presented with, and also how, how ill they were. Um, but looking at febrile illness, so diseases asso associated with fever, um, people would, um, after a few days of fever, frequently present to a Western healthcare clinic, whether they lived in, in a remote village or, um, or in a, um, or, or more, more in a, of a town. And what, what this, this work demonstrated was that there was rather poor record keeping in these rather under-resourced healthcare centers. Um, and usually what happened is that you got treated for malaria if you came with a fever. Quite reasonable because malaria is hyperendemic and kills lots of people in the region. However, if you, your fever doesn't go away, you come back to five to ten days later, um, then there's no, there's no reference to the, to, to the um, patients that were studied here, um, to their notes. Um, they were just retreated with malaria and given another diagnosis of malaria, um, even if with the same doctor seeing the same patient. Um, there was only really one opportunity in terms of the insurance um, that people carried for a diagnostic test, but usually that wasn't available and, and usually not delivered. And the few um, patients that, that came that uh, then represented a third time, um, sometimes in, in one case, um, sadly with, a, with a, what turned out to be a fatal illness, they were sometimes given a different diagnosis, um, but uh, that was not on the basis of any testing. And certainly, when um, that, that single patient died, as is common across uh, rural West Africa, there was no further investigation of the cause of death. I think that the, my overall interpretation of this is that there's more or less no ability for us to detect emerging infectious diseases unless there's widespread transmission between people. This is the unit that, we've, uh, that, we, that we built, um, that we conduct uh, experimental observations of, of a now very happily um, uh, flying around and, and breeding colony that we've had since uh, for the last five years as part of these collaborative studies, um, which have given us real insight into and you can see some of the ways that they use uh, what we thought were ways of containing them, but actually got rather happy to run around um, upside down at least uh, on the on the wire mesh that we use to, to, to retain them. But this has enabled us, uh, us to to come up with a, a, a far better understanding of virus persistence in small populations. Hennepin viruses will persist in a population of 100 bats. It was thought before that you needed hundreds of thousands of them. Um, what this clearly indicates is that this is a virus that can persist within individual bats. Um, the rabies-like viruses, however, didn't persist. And uh, we've all started to um, carry out some really interesting immunological studies as well within these, within these animals. And it was really this, uh, the immunological work, w which was the basis of, um, of us building the cage in the first place. We now started to look um, for the feeler viruses and try and understand how they persist in different species of bats and how they may transmit between different species of bats. And this is a really underexplored um, and very important question, um, a natural science question for how these, uh, these viruses may, um, may persist in different species of bats. And also we have no idea how much viral diversity there is of Ebola. We only have a few virus isolates that, that have come from, from humans or some from non-human primates that have been un unlucky as humans are to, to get the virus probably um, directly from bats in their case. And we don't understand that the, the viral diversity in the, vir in the natural reservoir, which is a really important thing that we need to characterize to understand how spillover may occur for Ebola in the future. So we're going to do um, a collaborative, far great, I'm sure, far greater genomic characterization. And this is um, understanding the genetic makeup of the viruses that infect bats and um, may infect humans. Um, but that's not going to 
necessarily enable us to predict all of the risks of different viruses. And I think we need, we need to understand far better what may predispose to spillover transmission into, into humans and our ability to detect it, because they're two entirely different processes. I think that, that detection almost, um, and certainly in rural West Africa, um, requires transmission between people or lots of, or a massive spillover events, which, which certainly aren't common. Um, and that's quite different from the spillover process, which is probably far more common than we realize, but usually most infections are dead end and don't transmit. And I think we need to work um, with, within the social sciences far more thinking about policy and responses to these sorts of things, um, community perceptions and understandings of these things in order to try and really look at what we can do to minimize risk, not just to the people who get it, but the people um, who may then receive infections from other humans that they've caught off wildlife. Because at the moment, um, so I think emerging infectious diseases um, have a questionable significance for public health. We all can see the impact of Ebola in West Africa. But actually, low-scale low spillover doesn't kill uh, probably as many people as malaria and HIV. Um, but it's the threat of, of spillover and what, what it may develop into that I think is the concern. And that's, I think, where we've got to think about who, who these sorts of things are important for. Really underemphasized um, that we need to think about the role of livelihood, livelihoods in driving spillover. And it may well be, and particularly considering poverty and development, alleviation of po poverty, that the greatest mitigating um, measure for dealing with spillover uh, is to, to re reduction in policy, um, uh, sorry, reduction in, of poverty um, and, uh, and general de economic development. There are great international teams of, of, of workers that have, uh, we've worked as part of bigger zoonotic projects um, that I'd like to thank for all of the insight and, and work, that, uh, work that's been done. Um, but uh, one of the great things that come, that's come from the, the collaborations that we've had uh, since 2007 in Ghana is it's enabled us to put a, um, a strong West African um, side of the, the Cambridge Africa program, um, which has uh, developed in, into the, the things that you've heard from, uh, into the programs that you've heard from David. And that's been, a, for, for me, one of the greatest pleasures of the, of the, the collab collaborative work. Um, and I think that's... I, I would say the same thing. It's been one of the greatest products. Really. It's, it's not just the nearly 20 papers that we produced in international journals over this time, but it's, a, it's the development and the um, development for the future that is a far more Im, uh, important um, element of or product from our work. Bats aren't all bad. They play a key role um, in, um, in the ecology of the world that we live in. And, um, and I think thinking about them just as sources of virus is a bit of a shame because these are great animals, they're very charismatic and um, much maligned. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, in the interest of time, we'll take just one question about these um, dynamic bats, if anyone has them. Jimmy, yeah. London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you very much, James. That was really fascinating. Um, but I wonder, could you comment on the ethical considerations of identifying potentially lethal viruses in bats living close to large human populations? So I think that you might say that it's, um, it's almost unethical not to do it. But then you've got to think about um, what it means for the people living close to these, um, close to these roosts um, before you start doing the work, in fact. And, um, and I think that's probably something we didn't do enough of before we started doing this work. We didn't expect to find all of the different things that we did. Um, what, what we found for the viruses that, that, that we work with in, in the human population that lives very closely with the large roost in Accra is that the... Um, we found no clear evidence of Henipa virus spillover and no ev evidence whatsoever of Lagos bat virus spillover, either to the people or the d domestic animals that live with them underneath the roof. So I think in, in relation to the risks that those populations pose, um, the really nasty ones don't appear to wide transmit widely. So then I think it's a... Um, which rather frames then how you deal, deal with, um, with those things. And I think it's the... Um, the, the more non-specific behaviours of the bats, um, like all uh, mammals that consume food, 
it's got to come out somewhere as well. And, um, and it's really the products of, of that, that that cause people far more concern and annoyance on a daily basis than the, the, the actual risks of, of fatal viruses. So it's a, um, I think it's also very important to think about the, the role um, that species such as bats, but in this case fruit bats, play in the broader ecosystem that we live in and our responsibility to that as well, which is rather, um, which if there's no spillover of a nasty virus into humans, then there's, there's less eth ethical consideration, but you might think it's a bit of a balance between virus risk and, and uh, uh, biological diversity and the ecosystem services and so on. And it's a, I think it's a, it, it's, a, it's a situation which probably is different for different species of bats and for different um, systems. But I think we have to understand them better in order to understand really what the, the risks are and what the ethical, ethical issues are. But I think it's one thing that, that I think would be a huge mistake is to say all bats are bad, let's kill them all, because that will have massive unintended consequences that may be worse than, um, w worse than uh, not doing anything at all about them and just taking simple measures to... Um, think about things. But I think that, that if, if I'm right in that uh, development and, and poverty alleviation are the best way of re reducing risks, then I think that's a good thing to think, for us to think about uh, ethical drives towards. So. Thank you okay, very thank much. You.